Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Spring Docs Q&A. My name is Camelia Shofani, and I am the Director of Public Programs and Events here at IDA. For our blind or low vision attendees, I'll be identifying myself. I have dark curly hair in a bun, light skin. I'm a Mexican Palestinian woman with a black sweater and a white background. I want to thank our media sponsors, Variety and KCRW for sponsoring our 2023 Spring Docs. Uh, this evening we'll be having a conversation between film journalist Matt Carey and director Zach Heinzerling, whose series Stolen Youth Inside the Cult of Sarah Lawrence is currently screening on Hulu. For more information or to see our other lineup, the rest of our lineup, please visit documentary.org. And before we start, I'd like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. IDA recognizes the Gabrielino Tongva as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land, water, and cultural resources in the unceded territory of Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Andrea Lust for ASL interpreting this discussion. And with that, I'll pass it on to Matt Carey. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am Matt Carey. I'm the documentary editor at Deadline. I am a white male, a middle-aged, I guess you'd say. I am wearing a sort of dark blue pork pie hat. Uh, I have a red background and glasses. And it's my great pleasure to welcome the director of this three-part series and executive producer, Zach Heinzerling. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm Zach Heinzerling, um, white male. I have light skin and um, sort of whitish, grayish, blondish hair. Um, and thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure, but it's such an absorbing and fascinating series. And if I understand correctly, it, it really began with a reach out from um, one of the young men who was drawn into this cult, uh, Daniel Levin. Yes. Um, so the project started when Daniel Levin sent me a a few chapters of his book. He wrote a, a book called Sloanham Woods Nine um, that is a memoir um, about his first few years at Sarah Lawrence. Um, the book was Daniel's way of processing, explaining this tragic episode in his life and the lives of a few of his friends. Um, and for me, it was a way of relating to him and the story and the story of survival that he very eloquently and um, patiently and, and beautifully wrote uh, in his book. The, the New York Magazine article is what most people knew uh, of this story, and it was incredibly important in convicting Larry. Um, but it left a lot of questions about who these students were, um, what led them to Larry, um, and a lot of the sort of humanizing um, details, um, perspectives that would allow someone to empathize with these survivors and identify with them and understand the Larry that they saw and knew and understand how attractive a person like that could be uh, to someone in their position. Um, because a lot of what Daniel had felt after the article was judgment from the public who didn't understand how they could quote unquote fall uh, for this person. And that was a lot of what sort of led us 
down this journey and and what kind of guided the direction of the storytelling was how do we help people understand who Larry was when the students met them and how mechanical of a process course of control is and how easy it is to fall prey to someone who's such a calculating and incredibly narcissistic um, manipulative um, psychopath like Larry Ray. Mm. Um, and so that's how the project started. But like many documentaries, it took all kinds of twists and turns and and I met more survivors and the story evolved. And so the 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 series is a product of about three years of work, um, starting with Daniel's book and ending with Larry being sentenced to 60 years in federal prison, which happened a few months ago. Hmm. And the audience has just seen episode three, which of course kind of shows that denouement, <clears throat> but maybe you could take us back to the beginning uh, where it's really kind of incredible to imagine, but uh, Larry is released from prison from an earlier uh, conviction, and then he moves into his daughter's dorm room at Sarah Lawrence. That's kind of the origin of it, but but explain some of what, how it all started, if you will, and and he assembled what he called his army. Well, Larry gets out of prison. Um, he had been convicted of stock fraud um and had basically um violated his parole um so ended up in in uh state prison and when he got out um talia was a sophomore at sarah lawrence and was talia living with his daughter yeah. talia his daughter was a sophomore at sarah lawrence and was living with seven of her friends um, in an on-campus dorm that it did not have an RA and you're basically in kind of an apartment um, and you have there's individual bedrooms and a common area and Talia had talked to her friends about her dad who according to her had been wrongfully accused um uh, and essentially was trying to save her, um, you know, from this conspiracy of people who had tried to ruin her dad's life. Um, and essentially he shows up um, needing a place to stay. And Talia and her roommates are accommodating. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming people that watch this have seen the series is that true i'm just sure. trying to figure most out how much them, detail most, to go into many it. will have but some uh, this may be their first uh, introduction to the story so that's why i thought it'd be helpful to <clears throat> to make sure that everyone knows some of these you know the the origins of it and and even if you've heard it before it's just really incredible to imagine this scenario yeah i mean i think there's a lot of factors with you know a, a place like sarah lawrence is is emphasizing independence among their student mm -hmm. body they you know of course it's not uh it wasn't allowed for a dad to live in the dorm but larry would sort of come and go he did have he also stayed in an apartment in the upper east side where he eventually moved with the students but while he was at the dorm he would sometimes stay the night in this apartment in the upper east side and he would sense when his uh you know if if someone was sort of paying attention to him and he just had a way of sort of evading um you know the system and befriending administrators and professors at the school and making his presence feel like a real added value to these individuals. I mean, the students, of course, were talking about how helpful he was, and he would help the students with their essays and their their schoolwork. And 
you know, sort of provide counseling or, or therapy as a kind of, you know, um, uh, as, as if, uh, you know, um, um, an on-campus counselor would. Um, and of course, when it's your friend's dad, uh, your friend, uh, who you have no reason to believe is is lying to you and and whose whose dad you know seems like he was essentially like the cool dad you know everyone likes a friend with a cool dad um mm-hmm. and he would bring them food and he would clean up in the apartment and he and you know sort of do the things that um mm-hmm. you know uh uh a helpful um you know, sort of adult figure would, but also, you know, wasn't, you know, stopping them from doing, uh, you know, having parties, et cetera. So, um, you know, for that first semester, um, he was well liked, you know, some of the students in the dorm were more suspicious than others. Um, but the series sort of tries to show how, you um, any number of individuals from very different backgrounds and very different circumstances, you know, ended up, um, you know, becoming sort of absorbed by his um, manipulative control. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you speak with so many of the survivors <clears throat> and in, in many cases with their parents. I'm wondering how you approach the the interviews, many interviews, obviously, over periods of time with for instance, Dan and uh, Raven and Gabe and uh, Santos, but particularly Dan and Santos and Felicia, others who were really drawn into the cult itself, because these are people who've gone through a tremendous trauma. And I I wonder as, you know, uh, an interviewer, as a documentarian, how how careful you must be in, in, in how you approach that. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it's, you know, these stories are really hard, um, hard to tell, uh, hard to work on, hard for the, you know, for the subjects, for the survivors to participate in. Um, You know, it's sort of your role as director and really the the team's role, you know, to... um, uh, on the inset, at the onset, you know, create um, a sort of ethos of, you know, can can this project be helpful to the individuals mm. that it is um, essentially, um, you know, uh, following? Um, can is there a way of this retelling of an incredibly traumatic story? um to be a positive experience for those who are retelling it um because there is trauma in the retelling of of your story that's without a doubt um so the the process sort of started with daniel and his decision to sort of create um an environment in which the other survivors um you know could feel uh, safe, comfortable, listen to, um, you know, Daniel wanted to tell his story because Larry had told everyone his story for him. And Larry had exploited all these individuals and not only told the story of their present, but told the story of their past to mm-hmm. them and for them and on behalf of them as a tool of manipulation. So here was an opportunity for Daniel to sort of reclaim his own narrative. And I think there was a snowball effect that occurred um where daniel's sort of expression of of how important it was for him to take ownership of his story um impacted the others and they were able to sort of find um you know a real sort of community in in this project and they were all uh, you know go undergoing their own sort of form of of counsel and therapy with with therapists um but at the same time you know the interview process can be a kind of mirror to yourself how you describe yourself how you talk about yourself you know of course this is all the most important thing is that there's this trust and comfort which i think comes with time right like we we spent the reason this project 
you know, took so long was because, you know, it was just a lot of getting, getting to know each other, Mm -hmm. sort of understanding intentions and, and being extremely, um, you know, upfront about the power dynamics that existed between the team, the documentary team and the subject, because Mm -hmm. these were not only traumatic things that were being discussed, but also this process of being interviewed was, was one, you know, that they had the last time experienced was in the form of manipulation through Larry. So there were a lot of layers to sort of, you know, getting to a place of, of, of comfort and, and, In the end, though, I think, you know, all of the survivors express a lot of gratitude to the team for not only the the sensitivity in, in in the eventual product, but the process, the interview process, you know, uh, giving them space to sort of understand themselves again. Um, You know, you see Felicia mid interview stop herself because she realizes that she's the narrative she's telling me is is actually Larry's and for the first time she's realizing that uh, that didn't actually happen to her and she wants to set the record straight and I think there's a version of that you know for everyone um, in this where there's this they're seeing themselves tell their own story and tell the story of what happened to them because it was so hard for people to understand. It was so hard for their families to understand, for their friends, what, you know, how did this happen? Um, and so they, they, they really wanted to sort of set the record straight and help people understand this story, but also how it could happen to them and, you know, potentially prevent, you know, this, this or, or help people who are in analogous situations. Yeah, one of the remarkable things in your series is the audio of Larry uh, doing these interviews that, and sort of later on they become more like interrogations and then there's video again of these sort of interrogations. Later on, we see acts of violence that he commits against Daniel and, and others, and Felicia as well. Uh, if I understand correctly, he provided those to you or allowed you to use them because he felt they were exculpatory for him. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's a product of the delusion that, you know, either a delusion or pathology or or it's very hard to diagnose Larry. Um, mm. But I think at that point, you know, he sent me emails with attachments of these, what he would label as confessions. Um, In actuality, they were confessions by his victims. But of course, he feels like, ah, they're, they're admitting that they've done terrible things to me and that sort of thing. Yeah, he labeled them as confessions, what they actually were forced interrogation sessions. Um, a form of gaslighting, um, manipulation, and control, uh, which was very obvious to anyone, you know, sort of listening to them. I think to Larry, though, he viewed them because they said the words, I poisoned you, he viewed them as, as you say, exculpatory evidence that would set him free, um, you know, uh, free from this conspiracy that had been ruining his life. Ultimately, Larry was looking for a reason uh, looking for a reason why he had been arrested, why anything negative had happened in his life, because it certainly couldn't be him. Because uh, as a narcissist and and in 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 um, that sort of delusional state, you know, can't really see the reality of the situation. But in the end, um, you know, the the great irony is that all of these recordings that Larry either made himself or had the survivors make ended up, you know, making it extremely easy for the government to convict him. Um, The trial essentially was the government playing this evidence Mm. for a jury uh, who quickly decided that, that Larry was guilty on all counts. Um, And, you know, uh, again, I, I think, 
um, I could go on and on about the irony of there's many ironies in the story. Um, but, you know, ultimately that, that audio and, and, and video also really helped not only convict him, but it helped the documentary understand a version of him that the students knew when they met him, a, a, um, a version that was helpful. Um, because that was sort of the biggest challenge, I think, in this project was, was how do we see Larry when the students met him um, versus the sort of mugshot Larry of the trial um, who had kind of devolved by that point. And um, so the, the, the archival helped us not only see the abuses, but also also see some of the sort of, um, you know, self-help guru-esque, um, you know, therapy that, that he was, um, you know, spewing in, in order to, to hook them. Yeah, there's a, <clears throat> there's a real arc to that because the the initial recordings that we hear in episode one, yeah, we sort of the self appointed therapist and again helpful dad. I'm I'm supportive. I get you. I hear you. You know, yeah, your parents don't understand you, whatever. But I do. And then it becomes far more sinister. But he doesn't. He, his opening salvo is not. I've got a crazy conspiracy theory for you. Um, and, and want to hook you in. So we, we see that pattern. And I think it's also very important to, as you, you indicate in the series of some of the mind control means and measures that he deployed, including sleep deprivation, giving them Adderall, uh, food control, and importantly, separate really from the very beginning conversations, it seemed to me, separating each person from their family so that they would no longer identify with their family but identify with him larry as their protector and sort of savior even so this helps us as an audience understand how this could happen i think absolutely yeah i mean i think um you know just seeing an image of larry also i think for the public you know he's he looks like this sort of schlumpy i mean he's mostly bald kind of overweight um he has a very thick staten island accent um he just doesn't present as the sort of when you think of these guru types um you know sitting on the proverbial mountaintop um so i think you know again for the sake of of the survivors um you know it was all about sort of like understanding it from their point of view um and honestly their interviews is is what i think is for me the most effective method of that because you know they're allowing you this and again daniel's book was the start of this but like a a, a way of accessing a time and place that can feel foreign um uh what was it like to be in college um what was your mind like in college you know we think of over 18 as as adults but you're quite young you're still a kid in essence um you're away from your parents for the first time you're being asked to do a lot of new things to be responsible for new things um and you're not equipped and you may not have had the kind of life experiences or met somebody who was even a shadow, a, a, um, a distant, you know, uh, Larry type person, you know, who might have ulterior motives, you know, that, that it, so the red flags don't exist yet because you, mm. you haven't created them in your mind to sort of, you know, understand that that might be problematic. And it's really like, we spent a lot of time, that was the the purpose of the animation really was to sort of put you in the mindset of, you know, the kind of adolescence that, that exists your freshman and sophomore year of college, you know, you're, it's still that kind of like innocent joy, um, you know, and, and, and just 
setting this sort of scene for viewers to be able to kind of put themselves there, um, you know, that that was of utmost important to understanding like how this happened. In this process of learning about the story and talking with the families and the individuals involved, what was most heartbreaking to you to hear? Uh, that's a tough question. I mean, it's it's also heartbreaking, you know, when you think of the Rosario family, I mm. mean, it's sort of unimaginable, you know, they sort of epitomize the American dream, a first generation Dominican family living in the Bronx, um, low income, all three of their kids end up going to amazing prestigious universities on full scholarships. Um, and are are so incredibly bright in different ways um and just beautiful people beautiful family so much love and you know to see the destruction that larry caused on every level emotional physical financial to that family um break them apart and make them resent each other for uh like unspeakable acts um and you know just not just destroy the fabric but make it almost impossible for that fabric to be woven again um um and you know by the grace of 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 a lot of things you know they are somewhat back together and there is a uh somewhat hopeful end uh, to the series, um, which I think is important to remind people, um, that in episode three, there is a kind of twist that, that gives you some op optimism, um, because of the darkness that you see in the, in the first two episodes. But, um, you know, so I, 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 I center on their story just because of how, you know, drastic the, the, the circumstances and and changes were but you know really everyone that intersected with larry's path has a has a tragic story mm. um you know uh, he is an evil and poison like no other um so i i i i hesitate to sort of you know compare um but um yeah it's it's hard to sort of think or speak about you know that that kind of evil yeah so many lives were devastated but but certainly the <clears throat> the rosario family stands out in the sense that it was all three siblings and i mean the destruction as you, as you eloquently described is, is so devastating i wondered um what you know of the status of talia larry's daughter we we hear that at least in some of the prosecutorial documents, you know, there's a suggestion that, that she could possibly face charges. Uh, you note that she didn't participate in the series, but do you know of her whereabouts or when, whether she potentially faces any charges or not? Yeah, so publicly, um, you know, what 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 you can find out about Talia essentially is that she is working um, in North Carolina as a legal aid um, as a um, at a organization called the Southern Coalition for Justice I think um, anyway she's she's um, her intention I think at, at some point was to go to law school but she's um i think hmm. a legal aid at this point um but you know we we didn't yeah we we she refused to participate in the documentary um you know so i don't really know what her feelings are about any of this you hmm. know i can um i could speculate that this <laughs> was a um uh, you know a, a disorienting you know last few years um you know i see her uh, as a victim um you know i think to be born into that situation 
um, where your father is. And, and I, you know, I, I listen to audio recordings of Larry um, gaslighting his daughters when they were, Mm -hmm. um, you know, seven, eight years old. Um, So the, the manipulation started when they were very young, you know, so she has been, um, you know, trained, um, groomed from birth, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I don't, it's very hard to sort of blame someone in that situation. You know, certainly she added to, um, the legitimacy viability of, of Larry, um, you know, was the connection point between Larry and these other students. And I'm sure, um, you know, validated for them, um, you know, what, what, whatever he said, um, in a way, but I don't, you know, I don't think that that was, I think within the context, um, you know, and it it seems to me that she won't be indicted because she hasn't been. Um, so, you know, I'm assuming that the, the government's position is, is probably similar. Um, but it's, it's complicated. Um, and that line of sort of, you know, victim and conspirator, co-conspirator, certainly in the case of Isabella is also complicated. So, um, you know, it, it, it would be interesting and, and we'll see, I, you know, I hope that she does, um, talk about it publicly at some point, but. Mm. Well, it would certainly be useful and helpful and interesting to hear that. And I wanted to ask one more global question, if you will, like some of the most successful documentaries in in recent years have related to cults. There's Wild Wild Country about Rajneeshpuram and in Oregon, and more than one documentary about the Nexium cult. And there are interesting parallels to the situation with um, with Larry Ray. But why do you think audiences are so drawn and fascinated by these stories? Um, yeah, that is a good question. I think there's a, um, you know, there's sort of a fascination with, um, you know, true crime that has existed for a while now. Um, you know, the, the idea of these things happen, happening, um, they seem so extreme, but they're happening to people just like us, um, you know, there's a a real fascination with um, these stories. Like, I don't know how many Jeffrey Dahmer projects have been made, um, but mm-hmm. many. Um, and as far as cults, you know, I, I think it's something similar in the sense that it gets to this extreme place where people are doing things that if you told somebody, you know, they're, they're drinking, uh, you know, Jonestown Kool-Aid, um, mass suicides, you know, Charles Manson, the, the, the details of what ends up happening, uh, are so extreme, mm-hmm. but where it starts, um, is an extremely relatable and an extremely everyday occurrence of, of meeting someone who is, incredibly nice and charismatic and promising the world um so to me i I feel like it's the sort of the tension of it if it being like what if what if it were me you know could could this happen to me um you know and that seems to be part of you know the the story of the husband who you know murders his uh, wife in a crime of passion that becomes a true crime series or a cult, you know, leader who preys upon, you know, uh, everyday people, um, and creates a sort of Ponzi scheme, you know, in the case of the Sarah Lawrence story, I find it incredibly relatable because, you know, I was, a, I was, a, you know, freshman in college, um, a liberal arts, a a smaller school. Um, you know, I had similar friends, 
um, you know, I was in a similar sort of mindset of figuring it out and Larry, someone like Larry would have been attractive to me. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think there's probably a darker answer, uh, that, that has to do with an obsession with, with, you know, crime and violence that I can't really speak to, but for me, the interest or what I perceive the interest to be is, is relatability in these mm -hmm. kinds of extreme cases um, and with Sarah Lawrence, it's certainly very relatable for me. I, I think that's very well said. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for joining us, Zach Heinzerling, the director and executive producer of the Hulu series Stolen Youth, Inside the Cult of Sarah Lawrence. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you for the IDA Spring Doc series. Thanks so much, Matt. I appreciate it. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks for having me.